Uh, well, at this time we're going <clears> to <throat> dismiss our children for our children's church. And if I could direct your attention uh, this morning to the book of Romans, chapter 3. beginning at verse 9. Book of Romans, chapter 3, verse 9. As the Lord wills, we're going to seek to cover verses 9 through 20. Uh, This is one of those, another one of those Sundays where I wish I was not a verse-by-verse teacher. I'd much rather teach topically and pick what I want to talk about. However, When you're committed to verse by verse, you have to talk about the pleasant and the unpleasant. And so this morning, our title is The Guilt of the Entire World. The Guilt of the Entire World. Where we get a very clear assessment of what God thinks about the human race without Christ. Well, as you know, we're in the middle of a study on the book of Romans, which is about the revelation of divine righteousness, how to get righteous and how to live out that righteous life. And uh, we know that Paul wrote the book. We know that it was written to Roman believers. We know that it was written from Corinth. We know that it was written about A.D. 57. We know that it was written to provide a church that had been started without the help of an apostle. The church at Rome was one of those few churches that came into existence without the oversight of an apostle. But it was written to provide a church like that with a strong doctrinal foundation. We know the book has a seven-part outline that we've been working through. We know the book is about the righteousness of God. And we know it is probably the most formal letter theologically that the Apostle Paul, under the Spirit of God, ever crafted or composed. We have finished the salutation section of the letter, which is the greeting section, chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. And thankfully today, at least from my point of view, we are going to be finished with the sin section of the letter. Chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 3, verse 20. It's a difficult section to teach through. It's a difficult section to read. And yet it's a necessary section because unless we fully understand who we are in the first Adam... We can't really understand our need for who we should be in the last Adam. In other words, a weak view of sin leads to a weak view of the Savior. Your average person out there in America in the year 2011 essentially yawns when they hear the name Jesus Christ. Big deal they're told, or they say. But the fact of the matter is, if they had a good understanding of what Paul is teaching regarding sin, they would be reaching out for the cure, Jesus Christ. But because they don't see their need for the cure, they don't reach out for the cure. You see, when you go to the doctor, the doctor to give you an incentive to submit to surgery, the doctor has to give you some bad news, does he not? And this is what the Apostle Paul is doing in this second section of the letter. Before he gives us the good news, he gives us the bad news. The human race, under the guilt of God, basically does two things. People without Christ basically do two things. The first thing they do is they move into license. They just say, well, I'm going to do what I want to do, and I'm going to sin up a storm. License. Paul has dealt with that in chapter 1. The second thing they do is they become very religious. Religious. 
They instinctively recognize that there's something wrong with them, and so they try to fix themselves. Religion. Paul has dealt with that in chapter 2. You remember the first act of religion recorded in the whole Bible is Adam and Eve, right after the fall of man, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, clothing themselves. You see, they knew something was wrong. They knew that they had fallen, and so they tried to fix themselves. That's religion. And those are the two directions people go in. The human race without Christ will move into license, or they will move into legalism or religion. And Paul is systematically working through this section of the Bible to explain that license does not make a person right with God any more than religion or legalism makes a person right with God. And so Paul has uh, explained to us that the Gentile world is guilty. Chapter 1, verses 18 through 32. The moralist is guilty. Chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. And then he also explained to us that the Jew is guilty. Chapter 2, verse 17 through chapter 3, verse 8. And now, this morning, we have Paul's summation of the whole matter, where he moves into chapter 3, verses 9 through 20, and he says, you know what, the entire world is guilty before God. And so here is an outline that we can use as we work through this section. We have, number one, a charge. Paul charges the human race with something. Verse 9. Number two, he presents the evidence. Verses 10 through 18. And number three, he renders a verdict. Verses 19 and 20. So there is a great deal of courtroom imagery in what the Apostle Paul is bringing forward this morning. And fortunately, next time we are together, we will begin to look at the solution to the problem. The solution to the problem begins in chapter 3, verse 21. But first of all, notice, if you will, the charge. Notice the charge that the Apostle Paul makes in Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Notice what he says. What then, are we any better than they? Not at all. For we all have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are under sin. You see, Paul just got finished explaining that the Jewish nation is guilty before God. And so the question would be, well, is it just the Jews that are guilty before God? And Paul says, no. We've already explained to you in chapter 1 that the Gentile world is guilty before God. And the summation of the entire matter is this. Every human being without Christ stands guilty and condemned before God. It matters very little what race or ethnicity they belong to. It matters very little if they're Jew or Gentile. It matters very little if they're male or female. It matters very little if they are slave or free. It doesn't matter what kind of car they drive. It doesn't matter what country they live in. It doesn't matter what kind of house they have. It doesn't matter what their socioeconomic status is. It doesn't matter what religion they belong to. All human beings, notice the word all and every, how it's repeated, In this section, all human beings stand before God guilty. Now, in verses 10 through 18, Paul begins to present the evidence. The evidence is laid out in verses 10 through 18. The theologians have a word that they use for this, or not a word, but a concept that they use for this, called the depravity of man. Some of you may have heard that term bandied about a little bit. What is the depravity of man? Well, let's talk about what the depravity of man is not before we talk about what it is. The depravity of man is not an idea which says people are as bad as they possibly can be. 
you know, even atheists give money to the Cancer Research Society. So it's not saying that people are as evil as they possibly can be. It's not saying either that people indulge every possible sin that they can indulge in. I can show you verses in the Bible where people who are unbelievers can do good things in the eyes of their fellow man. Jesus said in Matthew 7, verses 9 through 11, Or what man is there among you when his son asks for a loaf will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will he not give him, he won't give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? Jesus is saying that even the unbeliever knows how to bless their own children. Of course, we have another example of this with a man named Cornelius in Acts 10, verses 1 and 2. Cornelius was not yet a believer. Acts 11, verse 14, it says, And he will speak the words to you by which you will be saved. The man had not been saved yet. He's not a Christian. And yet notice this description of Cornelius, Acts 10, 1 and 2. There was a man at Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian cohort, a devout man and one who feared God with his household and gave many alms to the Jewish people and prayed continually. So depravity does not mean that man is as bad as he could possibly be. It does not mean that man indulges every possible sin that can be indulged in. Well, if that is what depravity does not mean, what does it mean? The concept of total depravity means that man is incapable of doing anything which would merit favor from God. He can appear righteous in the eyes of his fellow man. He can do good deeds in the eyes of his fellow man, but he can do nothing to merit God's favor. Total depravity also means that sin is so pervasive, it has touched every aspect of man's being. That's why we call it total depravity. Sin has touched man's mind, as we'll see today. Sin has touched man's emotions. Sin has touched man's body. In fact, if you look at all of the aspects of a human being, there isn't a single element or aspect of the composition of man which somehow has not been influenced by sin. And thus, Paul, as he develops this concept of total depravity, is going to lay out this morning for us 14 pieces of evidence, 14 counts as to why the human race is guilty before God. Now, as you look down through verses 10 through 18, you'll notice that in many of your Bible versions, everything is capitalized or there is quotation marks around it. And what this is communicating is this. Paul is getting all of this information from the Old Testament. Remember, Paul was a Jew. He was a, prior to his conversion to Christianity, a Pharisee. Part of the requirements of being a Pharisee was a knowledge, thorough knowledge of the Old Testament. And so Paul uses this knowledge that he has to string together a series of Old Testament passages explaining the total depravity of man. Most of the things Paul brings up here are taken from the Psalms. Now, most of the Psalms were written by David, and so we typically date most of the Psalms in the Psalter about 1,000 B.C. or 1,000 years before Christ came to the earth. And Paul's point is this. Look, this concept of the total depravity of man is not something that I invented. It's not something that I am making up. It's not some kind of new revelation that God gave to me as as one of his apostles. It is an ancient concept. And so we can take these 14 pieces of evidence, these 14 counts against the human race, and we can divide them into four areas. Number one, 
accounts or evidence related to character. Verses 10 through 12. There Paul will introduce six counts against the human race. Number two, we have a section called conversation. Paul will introduce four pieces of evidence against the human race related to how men and women talk, how they communicate, what comes out of their mouths. And then we have three pieces of evidence or counts related to conduct, verses 15 through 17. And then Paul will finally take us to the root of the problem. What is the source of the problem? And he will explain that in verse 18. And he will introduce a 14th and final count against the human race. But first of all, notice, if you will, the evidence against the human race related to character. And here Paul introduces six pieces of evidence or six counts. Count number one is given in verse 10. As it is written, see, he's referring to what God had already revealed a thousand years before the time of Christ in the Old Testament. As it is written... Count number one, there is none righteous, not even one. Count number one, no one is righteous, not a single person. He's probably getting these, this concept or this quote from Psalm 14 verse 1 and Psalm 14 verse 3. Nobody stands before God as a righteous person without the shed blood of Christ. All of man's attempts to fix himself and cover his nakedness before God are inadequate. It doesn't matter how religious a person is. It doesn't matter how many good works they've done. It doesn't matter how hard they've tried. It doesn't matter how sincere they may be. When God looks at the human race, he sees not a single person that is righteous before him. Of course, Paul was an expert in religion, wasn't he? Prior to Paul's conversion, he was Saul. He was a Pharisee. We read about his Pharisaical progress prior to his conversion to Christianity in Philippians 3. A Pharisee of Pharisees, he called himself, from the tribe of Benjamin. As to the law of God, blameless. There wasn't a man who tried harder to be good before God in the way he knew how to do it than the Apostle Paul, who was at that time Saul. But now that the light has come on, now that he has come to Christ, now that he can see his Old Testament in a clearer light, he says, you know what, there's not a single person righteous, no, not even one. Count number two, given in verse 11, It says, there is none who understands. Count number two, no one understands. No one understands, Paul says, the things of God. This is probably taken from Psalm 14, verse 2, and Psalm 53, and verse 2. Now, why is it that people can't understand the things of God? The answer to that is John 4, verse 24, which says, God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. God is spirit, and so you cannot interact with God. You cannot have a relationship with God. You cannot understand God without the Holy Spirit, because God is spirit. I mean, how in the world could you understand spiritual things without the Holy Spirit inside of you? This is why Paul will write in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, but the natural man, now that would be the man who is not a believer, does not have the Spirit of God in him, but the natural man does not accept the things of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. That's why when you get around a bunch of unbelievers and you want to talk about the Bible and the things of God, they look at you as if you're crazy. They don't have the Spirit. How can they possibly understand the things of the Spirit, especially when God must be worshipped in spirit and truth? People out there today without Christ 
do not understand the things of God. Of course, I may have told you the story of the missionary. The missionary goes and he <clears throat> wants to lead someone to Christ. And the person that's being evangelized says, well, I will come to Christ. I will believe in Christ. But you, Mr. Missionary, must answer ten questions that have always bothered me about the Bible. And the missionary looks at his watch and he says, well, I've got an appointment. But if you trust Christ now, I'll come back tomorrow and I'll answer your ten questions. So the man says, okay, he trusts Christ. The missionary leaves and comes back the next day and says to the man, I'm ready to answer your questions. And the man says, I don't have the questions anymore. They've all been answered. What happened there? The Spirit of God came into that person and allowed him to think and understand things at a spiritual level. Why could he understand those things now? Because he had the Holy Spirit inside of him. Jesus said in John 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. He can't enter, but he can't even see it. He can't even understand it. Count number 3 given there in verse 11. There is no one who seeks God. Taken from Psalm 53, verse 3. Count number 3, piece of evidence number 3, no one seeks God. You know, I used, <laughs> I used to think that one day when I was 16, I got up and said, you know, today's the day I'm going to look for God. Today's the day I'm going to become a Christian. And as I looked back on how I became a Christian, I saw very clearly over time that it was not me looking for God. It was God looking for me. John 6 and verse 44 puts it this way. No one can come to me. This is Jesus speaking. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. Luke 19, verse 10 says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which is lost. Notice who's doing the seeking there. Jesus is. The story of the Bible is not what man does for God. It's what God does for man. In other words, human beings are so uh, corrupted in their sin nature God has to make some kind of first move. That's the way Dr. Leitner explained it in class. God makes some sort of first move. God does something. God initiates. I believe the initiation is given in John 16, verses 7 through 11, when Jesus says, But I tell you the truth, it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him, and when he comes, he will convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. Sin, because they do not believe in me, and concerning righteousness, because I go to the Father and you no longer see me, and concerning judgment, because the ruler of this world has been judged. The Holy Spirit does some sort of work in our lives before we come to Christ. He convicts us. He convicts us of three things. Number one, sin. Notice that sin there is singular. Sin is later explained in that passage as the sin of unbelief. The Holy Spirit today in the lives of the unbeliever is not trying to reform the unbeliever. He is not convicting them of gambling and pornography and a bad temper. What he is convicting them of is a specific sin that they are committing against God, and that sin is unbelief. And the Holy Spirit not only convicts them of that, but he convicts them of righteousness because Jesus is leaving. They do not have the righteousness of God. And the third thing he convicts them of is judgment. Because the prince of this world is about to be cast out. In other words, the Holy Spirit is working on the lives of the unbeliever and he is expressing to them that unless you change your mind about Jesus Christ, unless you trust in him, you will be judged 
right alongside Satan. The prince of the world is being cast out. When I was 16, I heard the gospel for the first time in clarity. Perhaps I had heard it other times before and didn't understand it. And although this happened in 1983, I can remember it as if it was yesterday. The convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit came upon my heart in such uh, strength and clarity that I understood for the first time that I was not right before God. God did something. God made some kind of first move. Now, of course, I don't want to overstate the case because there is a doctrine out there called hyper-Calvinism. The hyper-Calvinist will tell you that a person has to be regenerated before they can believe. That's an interesting theological deduction. I personally don't see it supported in the pages of God's Word. I don't think God regenerates us so we can believe. I think the Spirit convicts us so that we will believe, and once we believe, then we are regenerated. There is an impartation of divine life. Count number four, it's in verse 12. All have (coughs) turned aside. Notice what he says, verse 12. All have turned aside. He's getting that from Psalm 14, verse 3, and Psalm 53, verse 3. What he is saying is the whole human race has missed the mark. The whole human race has wandered off onto its own path. It's sort of the picture of a caravan or a hiker who gets off the trail and can't find his way back. And that's the Pauline description of the human race. Count number five is also there in verse 12. Together they have become useless. He's getting that from Psalm 53, verse 3. Jesus in Matthew 5, verse 13, spoke about people's faith becoming useless. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has become tasteless, how could it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. And we see that same concept here in Romans 3. People's lives generally are useless before God. Now, they may be useful before man. Your doctor, who is an unbeliever, may do something useful for you. He may perform heart surgery or something to that extent. They're useful in terms of temporal things. But in terms of being able to produce anything with their life, which is eternal, their lives are useless in that sense. The unbeliever cannot contribute anything to his salvation. Isaiah 64, verse 6 says, For all of us have become like one who is unclean. All our righteous deeds are like filthy, like a filthy garment. That's how God looks at the religious activity of the unbeliever. He sees it as useless. It's not producing anything eternal. He sees it as useless. It cannot contribute anything to their salvation. Count number 6, also in verse 12. Notice what it says. There is none who does good. There is not even one. Taken from Psalm 53, verse 3. Again, man can do nothing of eternal value if he's disconnected to Jesus Christ. Jesus said in John 15, verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. You can do certain things in the eyes of man, but in terms of bearing the eternal fruit that God wants to bring forth through your life, You can't do anything of that significance without being connected to Jesus Christ. So we have six counts all related to character. None righteous, none understand, none seek God, all have turned aside, all are useless, none do good. say, well, I'm glad we're finished with all that. No, cheer up, it gets worse. 
We now move into verses 13 and 14 where we have four counts related to conversation. Four pieces of evidence introduced against the human race based on how people speak, based on how they talk. Count number seven is there in verse 13. Notice what Paul says. Their throat is an open grave. He's probably getting that from Psalm 5 and verse 9. Jesus made a very interesting statement in Matthew 12, verse 34. He says this, You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The mouth and what comes out of the mouth is simply a window into the heart of man. And because man's heart is wicked, what comes out of his mouth is wicked. You know, sometimes you hear people trying to get gossip under control. And they'll say, you know what, Lord, give us tongue control. Help us to control our tongues. And the issue is never the tongue. The issue is the heart. What comes out of the heart, the mouth speaks. People speak vile things out of their mouths because vile things are in their hearts. James 3, verses 11 and 12. Does a fountain send out from the same opening both fresh and bitter water? Can a fig tree, my brethren, produce olives? Or a vine produce figs? Nor can salt water produce fresh water. People speak terrible things out of their mouths because that is what is going on in the heart. The late uh, preacher Adrian Rogers put it this way, what comes up in the bucket is down in the well. You pull up that bucket out of the well and there's mud in the bucket. And the reason there's mud in the bucket is because there's mud in the well. Count number eight, given there in verse 13, it says, with their tongues they keep Deceiving. Count number eight, with their tongues they keep deceiving. Probably taken from Psalm 5 and verse 9. Speaking of how people employ oratory to deceive other people. Look at all of the deception in the world. Economic deception. We're living in a country, for example, where everybody is telling us economically everything's all right. Guess what? Everything's not all right. Why is it that the price of everything keeps going up? Why is it that every store I go into, they never say, hey, we've slashed our prices today. Why is it that Starbucks is now five bucks? Yet we're deceived into thinking that everything's okay. People use their oratorical skills to soothe our minds and our conscience, and they deceive us into everything is okay. Well, everything is not okay. Hitler deceived the masses through his ability to talk. Chuck Missler calls the coming Antichrist Mr. Big Mouth. And the reason he calls him Mr. Big Mouth is because as you study the coming Antichrist, what the Holy Spirit reveals is the man's mouth, what is coming out of his mouth. Daniel 7 and verse 8 says, While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among the three, and three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots of it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth uttering great boasts. Daniel 7 verse 11, Then I kept Looking because the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed. Revelation 3 verses 13 verses 5 and 6. It says there was given to him a mouth speaking arrogant words and blasphemies. And he opened his mouth in blasphemies against God. And on and on these scriptures go. Count number nine. Also given in verse 13, poison is on their lips. Notice, if you will, verse 13, the end of the verse. The poison of asps is under their lips. 
probably taken from Psalm 140, verse 3. Notice the word poison there. What does poison do? Oh, we know that poison kills. Poison destroys. Poison can make somebody sick or ill. All of us have had food poisoning at certain times in our life. And remember how sick we got. Sometimes you feel like you're dying when you're under the influence of food poisoning. That's Paul's description of what is coming out of the mouth of the unbeliever. What is coming out of the mouth of the unbeliever is destructive. It is killing. You say, wait a minute, I thought it was sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. That is a lie. That could not be further from the truth. The biblical understanding of the tongue is this. Proverbs 18, verse 21 Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You have an ability to, with our speech, edify people, build people up, encourage people, stimulate people to greater things. You have the equal ability to annihilate someone emotionally and spiritually. You have an ability through the tongue to put obstacles in front of people's paths that they will struggle with all their life. Life and death and the power of the tongue. It's hard to talk about this without talking about James 3, verses 1 through 10, which is a sermon in and of itself. But it says, Let not many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur the stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many ways. If anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able to bridle the whole body as well. Now if we put bits into the horse's mouth so that they will obey us, we direct the entire body as well. Look at ships. They are so great and are driven by strong winds, are still directed by a very small rudder, wherever the inclination of the pilot desires. So also the tongue is a small part of the body yet it boasts great things. See how great a forest is set aflame by such a small fire. And the tongue is a fire, the very world of iniquity. The tongue is set among our members as that which defiles the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life and is set on fire by hell. For every Species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by the human race, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Notice James brings up the same poison that Paul mentions here in Romans 3. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. For from the same mouth come both blessings and curses. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Well, that's just too convicting. I'm going to move on to verse count 14. Verse 14, count number 10. Count number 10 found in verse 14. Notice what it says. Whose mouth is full of of cursing and bitterness. So verse number 14, count number 10, is this. The unsaved world stands before God guilty because their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Probably taken from Psalm 10 and verse 7. You notice that bitterness is something that takes place in the heart. Bitterness comes from unresolved anger at somebody. And out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And so Paul says, as God looks at the human race, he sees bitterness and cursing coming out of their mouths. Their throat is an open grave. So now Paul has introduced four pieces of evidence related to conversation. Their throat is an open grave. With the tongue they deceive. Poison is on their lips and their mouths are full of cursing. Now as we move into verses 15 through 17, Paul will introduce three pieces of evidence related to conduct. Verses 
related to how people act. Count 11 is there in verse 15. Notice what Paul says. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Count number 11, their feet are swift to shed blood, probably taken from Isaiah 59 and verse 7. Proverbs 8 and verse 36 puts it this way. God says, all those who hate me love death. So the unbeliever is very quick to shed innocent blood. The human race is very quick to shed innocent blood. The human race has a tremendous propensity for murder. My goodness, we we, we hardly get into the Bible until we come to Genesis 4. We've only covered three chapters. Genesis 4, we have the first murder taking place. All who hate me, God says, Love death. It is interesting to me to look at the worldview of the people today who are promoting unrestricted abortion on demand, who are promoting euthanasia, and they are always coming from a humanistic, non Judeo Christian worldview, almost without exception. There are people who do not honor God. They are people who have no place for the Bible in their lives. And yet, these are the very people that are promoting death. All who hate me love death, God says. Count number 12, this is in verse 16. Notice what he says there, Romans chapter 3 and uh, verse 16. Paul says, destruction and misery are in their paths. Probably taken from Isaiah 59 and verse 7 as well. As you look at the wake behind the speedboat, the speedboat's moving and you could look behind the boat and you could see a wake. In the same way, look at what follows the lives of these unbelievers. Look at the wounded people. Look at the destroyed homes. Look at the destroyed bodies. Look at the failed philosophies they espouse. Everywhere their path goes, it's marked by misery, and it is marked by destruction. Count number 13, given there in verse 17, reads as follows, And the path of peace they have not known. Probably taken from Isaiah 59 and verse 8. The path of peace they have not known. How do you get peace? How do you develop a mindset where you can go through life and you experience internal peace, tranquility? How do you get peace with God? I don't know of any way to do it other than through the Prince of Peace. Jesus said in John 14, verse 27, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives give I to you. Do not let your heart be troubled, nor let it be fearful. The opposite of peace is being troubled and in fear, Jesus says. Jesus says, I do not give peace the way the world gives it. Well, how does the world give peace? The world gives peace through circumstances. If your circumstances are good, you can have peace. But what happens in those times of life where your circumstances become unfavorable? The world has nothing to offer. In terms of peace. But Jesus is speaking of a peace that a person can experience regardless of the storms of life. Paul in Philippians 4 verse 7 says, And the peace of God which surpasses all comprehension. Why does it surpass all comprehension? Because the world can't figure it out. The peace of God which surpasses all comprehension will guard, that's a military term, guard your hearts and minds, notice the last clause, in Christ Jesus. As Earl Chandler pointed out this morning in Sunday school, Paul wrote those words in prison. And yet, he's talking about a peace which surpasses all understanding. If you're here this morning without Christ, I'll just be very honest with you, you do not have the peace of God. You do not have peace with God, and you do not have peace 
in God, and you do not have peace internally. Isaiah 48, verse 22 says, There is no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. Isaiah 57, verse 21 says, There is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. Why is it that Paul says the world system cannot have peace? The path of peace they have not known, because they don't know the Prince of Peace. So how could they experience peace? So three counts related to conduct. They are swift to shed blood, paths of destruction, destruction is in their wake as they make their path, and they do not know the way of peace. Well, Paul, can you just sort of summarize? Can you just get to the bottom line? And Paul says, I'd be glad to do that. Here's the root of the problem. BLT, bottom line time. Here's the root of the problem. Count number 14 against the human race found there in verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes probably taken from Psalm 36 and verse 1. The reason they act the way they do is because they have no fear of God. And because they have no fear of God, they have no respect for God. And because they have no respect for God, they live their lives however they want to live them. No matter how depraved their lifestyle and their speech and their conduct may be. The book of Proverbs, chapter 1, verse 7, says the fear of the Lord is the what? It's the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Where does enlightenment begin? Where does wisdom begin? Where does knowledge begin? It begins with depositing oneself before God and saying to the Lord, you're the boss, I'm not the boss anymore. I'm going to live my life according to your principles, not my own principles. I'm going to stop playing this foolish game of dismissing you in my life. And the book of Proverbs says once a person does that, wisdom, knowledge begins. The reason people act the way they do and do what they do is because they do not fear God. They have no respect for God. They don't have any knowledge or respect for a future day of judgment. Did you know that that's what makes the Christian worldview different than practically every other view out there? It's this. This life ends in judgment. There is a day of accountability. Now, that day of accountability for the unbeliever is called the great white throne judgment. Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. You have to, you don't have to fear that day of accountability if you're in Christ. But did you know there's a day of judgment for the believer as well? Paul will explain that to us later on in the book about Romans 14 and verse 10, right in there, where God is going to hold us accountable for what we did in Christ with the lives in Christ that He gave us after we came to Him by way of faith. Everything is examined. And you look at Christians today, and you look at unbelievers today, and they just live oblivious of these coming judgments. It's as if these judgments will never come. When I was uh, going through my (coughs) Ph.D. program at Dallas Seminary, I knew that part of the program involved what is called comprehensive exams. What is a comprehensive exam? A comprehensive exam is where you are put in a smoky back room with four professors, and they have you back there for two hours. And each professor gets about a half an hour or so to ask questions. What are they going to ask? They don't tell you. There's no study notes. There's no uh, hints. And generally what they do is they start the questions off very broad and they get more specific very fast. The questions get more specific and more specific and more specific. And they do this for about two hours. Then they tell you to leave the room. 
And then they send you, they bring you back into the room after a time of conversation and they tell you whether you passed or not. Comprehensive exam. Anybody who goes through a PhD program at any level will go through a comprehensive exam. Did you know that the knowledge of that coming judgment scared the daylights out of me? <laughs> I went all the way through my program saying, wow, the professor's talking. I better write this down. Oh, the professor mentioned this book over here. I better go read that book. I did this for about three years because I had a knowledge that a judgment was coming. See, I had a knowledge that there would be a day of accountability regarding how much I knew. And in the same way, there's a judgment that's coming that's a lot more important than a comprehensive exam and, and for an academic degree. There is a comprehensive judgment coming for the unbeliever called the great white throne judgment. Those that are not in Christ will fail the exam. For the believer, there is coming a judgment called the Bema Seat Judgment where we will be held accountable and give an answer as to how we spent our lives in Christ. Even motives will be weighed. Am I up here preaching to you because I like the sound of my own voice? Or am I preaching to you out of a sincere motive? That will come up. Everything will come up. And yet Paul says the problem with people, believers and unbelievers alike, I believe, is they really have no fear of God. They don't think about these coming judgments. They just live their lives as if everything will continue as it has from the beginning, as the Apostle Peter says. We have seen a charge, verse 9. All are guilty under sin. We've seen the evidence presented, verses 10 through 18. We have 14 counts of evidence presented against the human race. So what then is the verdict? The verdict is expressed in verses 19 and 20. And with this, we will be finished. Two big ideas are expressed in the verdict. The first one there is in verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every, you should underline that word every, Every mouth may be closed, and the world, you should underline world, and all the world may become accountable, you should underline the word accountable, to God. What is Paul's point? Paul's point is the whole world is guilty before God. And don't fool yourself into thinking that somehow people without Christ are exempt. Every mouth, Paul says, all the world is going to stand before God in a day of accountability. It's coming. It's inevitable. God, who is outside of time and not bound by time, not bound by the three dimensions that we are bound by, can present this coming judgment as if it's already happened. It's, 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 in God's mind, it's, it's if it has already taken place. Paul said to the philosophers on Mars Hill, unbelievers, Gentiles, he says, because he has fixed a day, Acts 17, verse 31, because he has fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all men by raising him from the dead. Now, when they heard of the resurrection of the dead, some began to sneer. But others said, we shall hear you again concerning this. Some of you sitting here this morning are just sneering at this. This is silly talk. Others of you want to hear more about it. Others of you have believed. And my hope and prayer for everyone in this room is that all who hear it, Believe. The verdict has come. The whole world, Paul says, verse 19, stands guilty before God based on 14 counts or 14 pieces of evidence. Now, he communicates a second idea in the verdict. The verdict is given there in Romans 3, verse 20. 
And notice what the Apostle Paul says. Because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. The second idea communicated is the law of God, the Big Ten, the Ten Commandments. In actuality, 613 commandments that God gave to Moses cannot save you. Now the Gentile says, well, I'm off the hook because God never gave us as Gentiles the Ten Commandments. Wrong. We saw earlier in previous studies, Romans 2, verses 14 and 15, where God has taken his law and written them where? On the hearts of all men. The law, either through tablets of stone or the law as written on the hearts of men called conscience cannot save you. It cannot justify you. It cannot make a human being right before a holy God. The only thing that the law of God has the ability to do is point out sin. It can point out the problem, but it cannot perform the surgery which is necessary to correct the problem. I mean, imagine going to the doctor and the doctor tells you what's wrong, but he never tells you how to fix the problem. In essence, that's what the law of God does. Why is that? Because there is a solution to the problem. Paul will begin to explain the solution to the problem beginning in chapter 3, verse 21. The solution to the problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. The solution to the problem is God stepped out of eternity into time and paid for, through his death on the cross, all of my infractions against the law of God. He absorbed the wrath or the sting in my place. And consequently, when we study the atonement, we have to understand he is our substitute He didn't die on that cross to teach me to work harder. He didn't die on the cross to teach me how to be more sacrificial in my interaction with others. He died on the cross to absorb the wrath or the sting in my place. It's it's this way. Let's suppose someone has a gun aimed at you and they fire the gun and the bullet is coming for your chest and someone at the last minute leaps in front of the bullet and absorbs it in your place. They absorb the bullet that was intended for you. That's the gospel. And yet the gift of God is not something that becomes applicable or actualized to someone's life until they trust in the gospel. I can go over to uh, Walmart and get my daughter a present. Wrap it up for her, put it on the table, but until she receives it, the present is of no value to you, to her. And so there is a pardon. There is a pardon with your name on it. It's available. And you have to claim it by faith. You have to receive it. You have to accept it. You have to, what we would call, believe or trust in that promise. And the moment that happens is the moment the bullet is taken away from you. So when I come back up for the benediction, I'm going to say a prayer. And I'm going to pray, and I hope people will pray with me, that there is a Redeemer. There is an opportunity today to come to Christ. So in review, we have seen the charge, verse 19, All are guilty. We've seen the evidence presented, 14 counts against the human race, and finally, the verdict. Shall we pray? Father, we're grateful for the hard teachings of the book of Romans. Help us, Lord, take these things to heart so that we can understand the message of grace in a greater light and appreciate it more clearly. We will be careful to give you all the praise and the glory And God's people said. You can stand or sit, whatever you want to do. I'm just going to, we've got confusion in the assembly, Dan. Uh, I'm just going to say a prayer.
Father, your word is very clear. He who has the Son has the life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have the life. The wrath of God abides on him. I ask, Lord, if there's anybody here today that would like to make today the day of decision, like to make today the day they have trusted in Christ, I ask that they would do so. By simply uh, expressing some words, the words and the verbiage is not important. What's important is the condition of the heart. But your prayer might go something like this. Lord Jesus, I acknowledge the truths that I've received today. I, I acknowledge that I am not right with you. I acknowledge, Lord, that the Spirit of God is convicting me of sin, unrighteousness, and unbelief, and judgment. And at this time, Lord, I am responding by way of faith to the Holy Spirit and His convicting ministry in my heart. I'm trusting, Lord, in Your provision and Your provision alone for my eternity. Thank you, Lord, for what you have done for me in terms of your sacrificial death on the cross, your resurrection and ascension. I believe those promises. I have confidence in those promises. Amen. And if there's anybody here that has prayed that prayer or wants to learn more about praying that prayer, I would invite you to come talk to me or anybody really around you at the conclusion of the service. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.